Bloomberg. This is Breaking with Convention, War, Peace, and the Presidency, our two-hour daily, two-week special from the Republican, then this week, the Democratic National Convention in Philadelphia, to talk more about the historic nomination of Hillary Clinton and how the Black Lives Matter movement is reflected in the Democratic platform, we're joined now by two guests. Kianga Yamata-Taylor is the author of From Black Lives Matter to Black Liberation. She's an assistant professor of African American Studies at Princeton University. And Janae Ingram is with us, former executive director of the National Action Network and a member of the 2020 Leaders of America. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Um, let's begin with Janae Ingram. Your response to the nomination of Hillary Clinton last night, the formal acceptance speech that she gave on the floor of the Democratic National Convention, the first woman nominated by a major party to be president of the United States. Well, I, obviously, I think it's, it's a proud moment for this country that this has happened, um, notwithstanding all that has surrounded her nomination. I, I still believe that her nomination, uh, the first female, is is a is a moment that we need to pay attention to, and we we need to acknowledge as a history making moment. Um, I was happy about her speech last night. I think she could have done a little bit more with giving us personal a personal story. I think leading up to her speech, you had a lot of the speakers uh, and and the video. You had her her daughter talking about her as a person. Uh, the speeches in the nights prior, you had people sort of humanizing her and bringing that human touch. I was looking to hear a little bit more from that perspective, uh, but I was also happy to hear her talk about uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, even though she didn't specifically call it out. She did mention the fact that black and brown people are being uh, sort of brutalized, that's my word, brutalized by police. Uh, and I will say that was something, that was a recognition to have on a national stage by this candidate was important to the movement. Um, you had Reverend Barber earlier talk about Black Lives Matter. And so having that repeated by Hillary Clinton, at least in, in her way of saying it, was, in, was an important moment that shows, I think, a lot of the pressure that has been placed on her. She is feeling that pressure and she is responding to it, at least now with words. So I, I guess I was um, uh, thinking that the speech, along with the, the convention as a whole, in many ways has demonstrated this gap between the kind of uh, symbolism um, and the reality that exists um, on the streets of Philadelphia and uh, around, around the country. And so I think that... Um, uh, Hillary Clinton gave uh, a speech uh, that was full of platitudes um, and that, in, in some ways, I guess, was of symbolic value, um, but that really lacked any kind of specificity in terms of how we are going to uh, address very serious crises um, in this country. And so I think that, um, to me, that's part of the problem. I, I kind of walk away with the convention uh, with is there's all the talk about how great and wonderful um, the United States is. Um, and in many ways, uh, obviously, the convention reflected more of the uh, ethnic and gender and sexual orientation diversity in the United States, certainly, than the uh, Republican hate show last week. Um, but I think that what we've learned from the Obama presidency is that we have to move from symbolism into actual policies and programs uh, that are going to improve the lives of everyday, ordinary people. Um, and in the, the speeches throughout the week and Clinton's speech last night, um, I think we're still waiting for that specificity in how we go from uh, a kind of symbolic representation uh, of people to the actual uh, representation and improvement in the quality of uh, people's lives on an everyday basis. Mm. What would you have liked Hillary Clinton to say last night? Well, I, I think the, the two things that I'm most concerned with uh, have to do with Black Lives Matter um, and uh, specific policies that are going to be uh, advanced to stop police abuse and violence in black communities. Um, and also, uh, Hillary Clinton gave a, a very heralded speech 
in Harlem in February, where she talked about the uh, reinvestment um, in distressed communities. And that seemed to be something that was completely uh, missing from uh, the, the, the speech. So in a city like Philadelphia, uh, where this, the, the, the Democratic Party uh, has been having this party all week, there's 28 percent poverty. And half of those people uh, are living in what is defined as extreme poverty. And so what are the actual policies and practices that are going to be put into place uh, to address that? That's the, the, the concrete details um, that I wanted to hear about. Uh, Janae, why do you think Hillary Clinton is the best person to address the criminal justice system? I don't know that I would say that she's the best person. I think she definitely has a, a having had the experience that she's had, um, she does bring to the table uh, certain criteria that I think would be helpful as opposed to the person that she's running against. To say that she's the best person is not something that I would be comfortable saying. Um, I think given the two choices, you have Donald Trump, who has talked about essentially creating a law and order state, uh, which when you're talking about a, a fractured relationship between police <coughs> and specifically the black community, that is very troubling and disturbing to hear. Um, so given the two choices, I think having someone who at least is willing to have the conversation and to, to recognize that even if it is platitudes, that it's important that she says it. I was really waiting to see if it was going to be said by her, to be honest, um, because I, you know, I wasn't completely sure. But the fact that she actually acknowledged it means that there's an opportunity there for us to, to go further and hold her accountable to the things that she's saying. And you had this unusual moment uh, on the um, stage of the convention um, where the mothers of those who had been killed, two of them by police, one by a vigilante, uh, Sandra Bland, mm -hmm. mother, uh, Trayvon Martin's mother, mm -hmm. and Jordan Davis's mother. What did you make of that? Kim? Well, I, one, one thing that I, I uh, want to say, though, is that um, Donald Trump may, uh, in fact, talk about law and order and building a law and order uh, building further on a law and order society. But we have to remember that Bill and Hillary Clinton, in fact, did build a law and order society. Uh, with the passage of the uh, crime bill in 1994, the passage of the Effective Death Penalty Act um, in 1996. Um, and so in many ways, we are recovering from uh, the, the, the policies that were championed um, and, and doggedly pursued um, by the Clinton, the original Clinton administration in the 1990s. So I think it's important to say that. In terms of the appearance of the mothers um, of the movement, um, I know that if my child were killed uh, unjustly by the police or by uh, a racist vigilante, um, that I would want to do everything in my power uh, to bring uh, the, the, the perpetrator to justice. So I don't question the motives of uh, the mothers uh, who participated in um, the, the DNC program. Yeah, the fact that they were there. Absolutely. I do question, <laughs> however, uh, the motives of political operatives who I think would use the suffering of black parents uh, for votes. And so there's, there's nothing that I have seen yet in uh, Clinton's uh, policy platform um, that, to me, takes seriously uh, addressing the issues of uh, police uh, police violence. There's been talk about money on police training, um, that sort of thing. But what about police accountability? Uh, what is, is actually being talked about in terms of holding the police uh, uh, accountable for the deaths of black people? We've just seen this, this week, Freddie Gray. Apparently, no one killed Freddie Gray. Freddie Gray's death was declared a homicide and no one will be held to account. And so that, I'm interested in what Hillary Clinton has to say about that. And that's what I mean, that we have to move beyond promises during election time and platitudes into concrete specifics of what elected officials are going to do uh, to defend black people um, from, from violence and abuse at the hands of the police. You know, I, 
going back to the the earlier point about the the Ingram. yes uh, the crime bill um, I while I agree you know that was not the right legislation that we needed to have and clearly we are we are seeing the effects of that daily um, the the Clinton Clintons champion that um, and so by doing that they are the face of that I, I will say uh, there were other people who championed that and who supported that bill, who looked like us, like the two of us. And so, you know, at that time, I want to put the context behind that bill. At that time, there was a lot of crime and there were a lot of people of, of all races. It wasn't just the Clintons who were saying this is the bill. Um, and so there is a responsibility that we have as a community. And I think that's the part that I think is really important. Yes, we're talking about, we need to talk about policy solutions, but offering policy in and of itself does not guarantee that that policy will even be implemented. Power concedes nothing without a demand. So yes, we have to make sure that the power structure is, is meeting our demands and is essentially responding to the things that they said that they were gonna do. There's a certain level of, of accountability that I don't know has been achieved yet. And that, that's not just by the black community, I think that's by uh, the, the American society as a whole. I think that's part of the frustration that you're seeing coming out with the Bernie movement. Uh, people don't feel like politicians have been held accountable. But what, is fa what they fail to realize is that we are the ones that are supposed to keep politicians accountable. And so with that, I think, you know, we're talking about policy solutions. I think Hillary Clinton needs to have someone in her ear talking about what types of solutions need to be had. I, I don't know that, given the 94 crime bill, mm -hmm. that I would fully say, you know, have at it, you create the policies and we'll be behind mm -hmm. it. it. It needs to be a conversation. Dianga. Yeah, I would just say that, um, first talking about the, the, the 1990s, um, I think it's one thing if you're in a black community that is absolutely uh, having um, issues with, uh, with crime and poverty because of uh, uh, decades-long disinvestment um, in jobs and infrastructure in black communities. And you were left with no other viable alternative. So the alternative wasn't either support the crime bill or support this host of uh, public policies that are aimed at uh, rebuilding the public infrastructure, rebuilding uh, uh, public programs that um, are intended to mitigate the worst aspects of poverty. People weren't given that option. In fact, Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton helped to usher in a period where they declared the era of big government, i.e. government programs, is over. And so the only alternative that people were given was more police and more prisons. And that that's the very important context, because the thing I think that we missed that was most pernicious about Clinton policies in the 1990s, the crime bill, the effective death penalty act, welfare reform, was not just that people ended up in prison, was not just that poor people lost access to important government benefits, but most importantly is the damage that was done to the idea that government has a role in the life of everyday people, that government has a responsibility to poor and working class people. And in fact, they helped to disconnect the idea that government has any, any role. They helped to disconnect the idea that poverty, that economic inequality is responsible uh, uh, for the issues of crime, uh, that those things were responsible uh, for people's reliance um, or, or need uh, for welfare. And these are ideas that we are still contending with uh, uh, today, the idea that government somehow is, 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 is a bad thing. And what is your assessment of Donald Trump, where he fits into this? Uh, let's begin with Janae. My assessment of Donald Trump is obviously that he is using fear as a tactic to uh, sort of gain him some votes, popularity. Um, even seeing his most recent comments, uh, talking about hitting some of the speakers. I mean, it's it's he a. He was in Iowa, and he yes. said that he wanted to attack he some wanted of the to DNC he, speakers. He said, I believe he said hit. Hit. You're right. He wanted to hit some of the speakers. It is appalling to me that this man is a nominee to be president. Mm -hmm. uh, it, 
I can't even fathom that this is the person that some people in this country want to lead this country. What he's doing is not leadership. What he is doing, I don't even know the word for it, but it, it's disgusting. Whatever it is, it's disgusting. Um, and, and ultimately, you know, I think at the end of the day, I, I noticed in the package that one of the packages you showed, you, someone was talking about how uh, there was this sense of nationalism at the DNC. Um, and I noticed it, too. I noticed the, the signs and the chants. Um, what I attributed that to was when you have a person who is talking about making America great again, as if America hasn't made strides, and talking about taking America back to a period when I don't think it was great at all. Uh, let me not say at all, but I don't think it was as great as it could have been. It did not live up to the ideals and the tenets that we want to hold America to. I think that was the, the reason behind all of that sort of sense of nationalism, to basically say, this is still a nation to be proud of. Kianga, I'm going to end with the question about movements and where they fit into this whole electoral process into November. Well, I think the, the, the movements are quite critical in terms of keeping alive uh, the issues that um, are most important to us, because to be honest, uh, there would be no discussion about police violence mm -hmm. and police brutality. There would be no discussion about Black Lives Mattering uh, without there having been, um, since August 9th of 2014, uh, a, a movement um, uh, highlighting and exposing um, that police violence is not just a case of bad apples or road cops, mm -hmm. but that it's absolutely uh, systemic. And so um, I actually think that uh, in order to uh, keep these issues alive, uh, in order to keep whomever is elected in November to keep their feet to the fire, uh, that the movement can't collapse into uh, just su blind support for uh, Hillary Clinton, because we know that Donald Trump is, is not on the agenda. Um, and that the movement needs to remain uh, politically independent with its own set of independent uh, objectives and, and, and goals that are not tied to whomever becomes president. Well, we will certainly continue this discussion in these months to come. Kianga Yamata-Taylor, author of From Black Lives Matter to Black Liberation, and Janae Ingram, former executive director of the National Action Network. This is Democracy Now!